All right. I'm so excited, Kayla, to welcome you onto the podcast and share your expertise. So welcome. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. I've been really looking forward to this conversation. Yeah. And I saw you talk at uh, Paleo FX and I loved everything you said. Some of it I have committed to memory and I, it just really left an impact on me. And as I was watching, I was like, my podcast listeners need to hear you. So I'm excited that we're able to make this happen. And so one of the things that you talk a lot about, well, maybe you can start with a little bit of just, do you have a health story or just how you became passionate and what you're, you know, what you do today? Let's start there. Yeah, so I've always been interested in health and human behavior. And uh, from a young age, my mom always told me um, that I was going to be a brain surgeon. <laughs> and that must have stuck somewhere. Of course, I'm not a brain surgeon, but I'm a neuroscientist. So it's a similar vein, right? <laughs> I work on the brain, but I don't cut it open. Um, but uh, I've always just been really fascinated by what drives human behavior. And especially um, in women and what drives women's behavior and women's health. And the reason why I've been so fascinated in that is because my family members, the women in my family, um, have really struggled when it comes to their health, when it comes to their mental, physical, emotional health. They've really struggled. And even when I look outside of my family, um, within my friends and within my community, I see that women are generally um, a little misguided and misunderstood when it comes to their health, right? A lot of us are pretty confused because we do all of the things that we've been taught to do to take care of our health. You know, we follow the guidance of our favorite influencer to the T. We do the fasting, we do the exercising, we do the supplements, we do all of these things. And then we still find ourselves not really feeling very well. And, you know, oftentimes running into burnout and having mental health issues and having energy issues and having autoimmune issues and the list goes on, right? Um, and so I was very curious about that. Why? Why are women suffering so much? Like what, what, what makes women different than men? What impacts our health that maybe doesn't necessarily impact um, men's health the same way? And with myself personally, I found um, kind of the same issues arise, which was kind of shocking to me because I am trained in the health sciences, you know, I have an undergraduate degree in health ecology and I have a master's degree in public health and epidemiology and I've studied all of the ologies right the biology and the chemistry and the neurology and all of these things and and so you know i've been taught how to take care of my human body and my health, um, however. In my late 20s, I ended up with full on adrenal burnout, which led to full on hormonal burnout of my ovarian hormones as well. Um, and all of that was a shock to me because, like I said before, I was following all of the things that I knew how to do to take care of my health to the T. I was eating perfectly and clean, I was exercising every single day. I was doing all of the things that I should be doing, taking all the supplements, using all of the devices, doing cold exposure, doing saunas, everything, right? All the things that we love to do that are super fun. And I still ended up with full on burnout. And so I was like, what the heck is going on? Um, so at that point, I was um, working as a health scientist at CDC, and I was also training as an athlete with Team USA in duathlon. And I had started my PhD in neuropsychophysiology. And when this happened, it kind of put a pause on my life and a redirection. And it kind of put this exclamation point on, on you know where I was and what was going on with me. And so at that point, after doing an exploration of my own health and getting you know all of the lab tests done literally thousands and thousands of dollars of lab testing and protocols and supplements and all the things that you do right um i found out that i had full adrenal burnout and 
hormonal burnout. And in fact, my female hormones um, had completely flatlined. And my, my doctor had said, uh, you know, you have the, you have the hormones of a 90 year old woman. And I'm surprised that you're even functioning as well as you are, you should be happy that you're functioning as well as you are. And I was like, what the heck? Like, how did this happen? Um, so at that point, that's when I really shifted to focus only on women's neuropsychophysiology, because I wanted to find out what's going on with women. What's going on with me? Why are we struggling with our health? Why did I do every single thing that I was taught to do to take care of my health perfectly and consistently? And I still failed. And if I fail at this, then what chance do other women have who don't have that level of education about their health? Um, so that's when I kind of shifted and went down this rabbit hole. And what I discovered in this rabbit hole has completely transformed my life. It has completely transformed the lives of women that I am um, so lucky to be able to teach and guide. And it's all driven by this, um, this lack of understanding about women in their bodies. And, you know, this is, this is that first major discovery that I had was that women represent the largest gap in health science research that exists today, meaning that women since the beginning of time and up to current times are left out of the clinical and medical research. Um, and that's something I had no idea about until I started going into the research to find it and it was did not exist. Um, and so that's what really shifted me and brought me down this path. That's amazing. And I, I can't believe that you experienced that burnout, but even knowing as much as you did, but I feel like that is such a common thing to so many women. And, you know, regardless of your level of education, it's like, sometimes you might know the things. And I feel like I'm resonating really strongly with what you're saying, because I teach people all the time that stress is the most underestimated, you know, and underassumed cause of blood sugar dysregulation. And meanwhile, I'm a living proof that the stress can impact us really badly. And I'm, yet I'm teaching this, but it's the hardest thing to walk the walk in terms of that, like the food stuff I can easily dial in. And I think a lot of us yeah. might be like that. It's like, we'll take the supplements, we'll do the workouts, we'll eat the food, but then it's like, well, stop being so busy, say no to things, you know, rest during certain times of your cycle, you know, say like say no to the social events. Sometimes like these are the things that is, are really hard. I mean, sit and meditate for 10 minutes. I'm like, I don't have time for that. Of course I have time for that. Like if I have time for two hours of social media and responding to comments, you know, we absolutely yeah. have time, but we're not making time. We're afraid to take that time for ourselves, or we think we're wasting time, or maybe, you know, we're a lot of women, you know, single parents, sole breadwinner, like you don't have the time. It's like, how can we support these women? And why are they, why are they so left out? So why yeah. are women left out of the research and um you said they were left out until the 90s is that well actually they're still left out even today so there's two reasons why women have always been left out of the research um okay. and this was solidified in 1977 when the fda formally banned all women of childbearing potential from all clinical research that ban remained in effect until 1993 when the office of women's health overturned it and then said we have to include women in the research yet even today women are not included because of the same two reasons that got us banned to begin with and those are one women are risky research subjects meaning that they can have the potential to become pregnant at any time right so the risk is high from an ethical standpoint and as a researcher myself i get it that makes sense it's actually extremely difficult to even get irb human subjects approval doing research on women with this additional risk that they pose right um so the second reason is even more frustrating um, and also understandable from a researcher standpoint, which is that women are biologically extremely complex. 
because of their hormone cycles and how that impacts their physiology. Um, so because of those two reasons, that's why the FDA eventually banned women from research. But even to this day, it's these are still the two reasons why women are left out. To be able to do research on women, it takes a lot of additional resources. It takes a lot of additional expertise and it takes additional time as well as one of the, those resources that it requires because we have to consider our hormone related biochemistry, neurology and physiology and how it shifts over the course of a month, which is, you know, a lot to control for in a research setting. So what happens is these companies who want research done, right? A lot of them are big pharma, um, but there are other other research entities, they want to get the research done and they need to get it done as cheap as possible and as quickly as possible. And so the only way to do cheap, quick research is to only include men. And so that's what is being done. Wow. That is really alarming and <laughs> startling. So in addition to our, our hormones being different, what else is there like a cognitive difference that women have as well? Oh, absolutely. So, um, you know, maybe we can talk about these hormonal differences that really have this global effect on our cognition, on our respiratory system, our cardiovascular system, our immune system, our musculoskeletal system, our nervous system, our metabolism. Literally every part of us is impacted by the ebb and flow of estrogen and progesterone across the month. And so this is why I say that women are actually four different people over the course of a month because we go through four different significant hormonal shifts. And each one of those has its own biochemical, neurochemical and physiological signature. And so that's why we are such um, extremely difficult research subjects because we're not just one subject. We're a changing subject. We change significantly four times over the course of a month and that really absolutely has to be considered. In the research that is properly done, including women, they have to uh, delineate the data by hormonal phase, otherwise the results are not accurate. Um, now, the amount of research that is doing that is extremely, extremely, extremely tiny. Mm -hmm. That actually include women in the appropriate um, numbers that they should be including women. And then of those research studies, which are tiny in and of themselves, maybe about 200 studies that I've gone back and collected over the past six years um, that appropriately include women, of those handful of studies, the ones that actually delineate the findings by hormonal phase are a tiny fraction. So we're looking at a huge gap in the information flow that is required for women to be able to, first of all, understand their own bodies. And secondly, for our health professionals to be properly educated and to guide women properly about their health. None of this is happening. Even when we look at our biological textbooks, we are looking at um, education that is created around data that comes from male centric research. So even what we're taught about our biology is not fully accurate for women. So it's a, it's a huge problem that stems out into so many areas and it all comes back to this one key difference and that is hormones. But I'm not talking about any kind of hormones. I'm not just talking about estrogen and testosterone, right? I'm actually talking about the hormones that set the pace of a person's biological functions. So for men, that is the adrenal hormones. Our sleep-wake hormones, which is cortisol and melatonin, are what drive the male biology and set the pace of the male physiology. So what that means is that the male biology operates on a 24 hour repeating clock. So day in and day out, men are very, very consistent. Essentially, they are, you know, the same 
person every day. There are small, very small changes that happen over big long periods of time throughout the lifespan. And that's the case for women as well. But from day to day, men are physiologically, biologically consistent, right? very predictable, which is nice, which is really great for research. Um, now, when it comes to us ladies, things are a lot more complex. And that's because we have a very different biological rhythm that is set to the pace of two other hormones, which is estrogen and progesterone. So for us ladies, yes, we still have that same sleep-wake cycle of cortisol and melatonin, that 24-hour repeating circadian rhythm. However, that is, these are not the hormones that set the pace of our global biology and determine, for instance, our respiratory function, our cardiovascular function, our brain function, our metabolism, all of those things, right? What sets the pace of our biology as women is the ovarian hormones, estrogen and progesterone, and as we know, those two hormones change over the course of a month significantly four times. And that's why physiologically speaking, women are four different women over the course of a month. And so this has major reper repercussions for every aspect of our lives and our health. When you look out into society, you see that we have created a society and infrastructure and environment systems constructs around a 24 hour repeating system because why because that's the data that we have right the data that we have to base our decisions on is a data set that is very much male centric it's not including women and it's not including women's data so of course this is how we have designed the world and even when we look at our health when we look at the health recommendations that come out from our doctors on major medical protocols that come out from our health coaches, that come out from our fitness coaches, that come out from our nutritionists. They are all doing the best they can with a limited amount of data, which is centered towards men. So all of those recommendations as women, we have to take with a grain of salt because those specific recommendations are likely only appropriate for us during one week out of the entire month and the rest of the three weeks out of the month, those recommendations are absolutely not appropriate for us. And so we have to start to discern for ourselves, you know, which version of myself am I working with in this week? And how do I make my health choices around that? Wow, that is so profound, all that information. Um, you know, women having this 28 day cycle men having a 24 hour cycle is so different. And so can you break down those four stages for us and tell us the different, the different women we become during, during yes. um, that month. And, you know, this is why it's important, just like what you were saying, how we need to think about the caveats for women. So you'll hear, oh, keto is great. And for women, we need to yeah. think about our hormones. So we need to change it in these ways. Or like fasting is a really great tool. And for women, we need all, all these things. So there's so yeah. many differences for women. I've, I've had a lot of people ask me, oh, do you also work with men? And I'm like, first of all, I work with everybody. I don't know. I must just attract women to me. Like maybe people think I'm girly. I don't know, maybe because I had PCOS and I talk about that a little but I do work yeah. with everybody, but the majority of people who I work with happen to be women. And I'm like, yeah. men are easy. <laughs> like they don't have those pesky menstrual cycles to worry about. Like they're so much easier. So I feel like you have yeah. to specialize in working with women. Whereas, I mean, obviously I'm oversimplifying, but like in a sense, it's kind of like the default to work with men because that's all the information that we have available to us and you have to yeah. go out of your way to look for extra information to help serve women. So can you take yes. us through those those four cycles for um not cycles but the four pieces of the cycle? Absolutely, yes. And you're absolutely right. You know, our our coaches, our health professionals, even um, you know, anybody who supports women in any way, financial advisors, business coaches, um, life coaches, we all deserve to have this information so that we can properly support women. And so that's why 
I'm out here doing this work and sharing this information is because, um, you know, like you said, the information is just not available about women that we all need to be working from. Um, so yes, let's talk about the four different women that we all are over the course of the month, which is actually quite magical. Once you can, once you can learn uh, these four versions of yourself and learn how to navigate and, and align your lifestyle with all four versions of you, your life really does become magical. It's basically like the ultimate biohack that the other half of the population does not have access to. Um, so phase one is the menstrual phase. And this is the first woman that we're going to talk about. And this phase is unfortunately the only one that most women are aware that they have. So typically, you know, women know I either am on my period or I'm not on my period, right? Um, and that's about the extent of the education that we get, um, you know, elementary school through 12th grade. That's about the extent of it is like, you have a menstrual cycle and you're going to have a period. And then, you know, when you're not having your period, it's the rest of the time, but it's so much more complex than that. Um, so phase one is when you are menstruating. So it's when you're having that period, it's about week one of that month long, what I call a biological rhythm or a biorhythm. Um, and remember the, menstrual cycle is the centerpiece of the female biorhythm but it is not the female biorhythm in and of itself it's just the driving force of it so in phase one it's the menstrual phase this is when those two key hormones are at their lowest level in comparison to the rest of the month so estrogen and progesterone are at their very lowest level during this phase during this low hormonal phase, what that translates into physiologically is a kind of global slowing of processes. And what I mean by that is our metabolism and our metabolic function slows down during this phase when those two hormones are lower. Um, and this actually translates to a, a slower and different conversion of our macros, right? So our carbs, fats, and proteins into acetyl-CoA and through the citric acid cycle, ending up in ATP, which is energy for the cells. So that whole system slows down. So women have less access to ATP. We have less energy during this phase. What we also see is when we shift over to what's going on neurologically, we see that we have lower levels of key neurotransmitters um, in our brain or lower activity of the neurotransmitters that are involved in excitatory and mood boosting mechanisms. So we're talking about serotonin, dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and glutamate. So less activity of those neurotransmitters. So a lot of women will report having, you know, a little bit of brain fog during this time. Um, and it may actually not be brain fog. It just may be that um, you are not understanding that you have a little less resources to work with during this time, and you may be burning through them faster than what you need to be. So really, you know, every phase is all about understanding what your biological needs are, understanding where your resources are, how many of them you have, and allocating them appropriately um, so that you don't end up in burnout, right? Burnout is you've run through your resources and now you are putting extra demands on your body that cannot be with, withheld, right? Um, so phase one sounds kind of like a bummer, right? It sounds like we're getting less energy. We're getting our brain function is kind of slowing during this time. We have less resources to work with but it's actually absolutely brilliant and beautifully designed the whole female biological rhythm. Because in phase one specifically, when we look at how our brain function shifts, we see that with this low hormonal phase, women actually have heightened what's called cognitive empathy in the scientific community, but that's a fancy scientific term for intuitive insight. So a woman's intuition, first of all, 
is not only a real thing, we can measure it now with brain imaging studies, we can measure and start to understand the mechanisms of intuition. But our intuition as women is heightened in phase one. So think about how brilliant that is. Our body is slowing us down. It's taking our outward focus and the distractions and turning it inward because we have to conserve those resources, right? And it's turning our attention inward so that we can actually benefit from this cognitive superpower of sorts that we get during this phase, which is intuition. So going from phase one into phase two, this is the follicular phase. And this phase is marked by a hormonal shift, which is estrogen that is rising to a peak. So I call estrogen the superstar of this phase because that's the key hormone that is driving the physiological shifts that occur. As estrogen rises to a peak, so does our metabolic activity and that conversion into of our macros into ATP, the, the fuel source for our cells. That is gets higher and higher as estrogen rises. So as that whole process happens, our endurance, our energy levels, our power and our strength also increases as estrogen rises. Now, when we look at what's going on in the brain, um, neurologically, we see that we also get a nice rise in these excitatory and mood boosting neurotransmitters. So we have um, higher energy levels, we have more focus, we have more stamina, right? Mental stamina, and we have a higher mood. So we feel more and more social during this phase. And interestingly, because of how the brain shifts um, in its neurochemical and neuroelectrical function with that rise in estrogen, we see that we get higher and higher emotional intelligence during this phase as well. So our ability to communicate with, connect with other people and understand other people is heightened as estrogen rises. So our um, cognitive superpower during this phase is navigation and strategy. So if you think about that, um, how these shifts occur physiologically and cognitively, again, how beautiful is this? You go from phase one where you have this heightened intuition. So that's when all of us should be doing our assessments. This is when we should be determining how to allocate our resources for the rest of the month. This is when we should be doing our decision making. And then we go from that point into the next phase and we have this heightened emotional intelligence, this heightened ability you know, for leadership, this heightened ability to navigate and actually take those strategies and put them into action. And so it goes, it goes perfectly from phase one into phase two, how we can kind of integrate this into our lifestyles. Then going from phase two into phase three, this is the ovulatory phase. And this is more of a phase shift than a phase in and of itself because it's very short. It's only between one and three days. Every woman's a little bit different, but essentially phase one is week one, phase two is week two. And at the end of week two going into week three is this ovulatory phase or phase shift. But it is an important phase to delineate from the others because this is when we get our peak in estrogen, but we also get a nice peak in luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. And with all of those juicy hormones rolling around in our body, um, a lot of amazing shifts happen, but significantly we have this peak in energy. We have this peak in mood. We have this outward focus. We have this peak in our power, strength, and endurance. And our cognitive superpower during this phase is charismatic influence. So this is when, you know, we should be doing our pitches or our um, strategic partnerships or networking events, if we can leverage this very short but very fruitful time, um, we can have a greater impact in our lives, in our careers, in the way that we operate in the world. So it is a significant time to um, be able to identify and then utilize for our benefit. 
And then going from phase three into phase four, this is the luteal phase, and it's actually the longest phase. It's the second half or the, the last two weeks. And this is actually my favorite phase. It's what I call the brainy phase, which I'll explain that in a minute. Um, but this is the phase that gets the bad rap, right? This is when PMS happens, which by the way, to me is a um, lazy diagnosis for any kinds of issues that women are having during this phase. It all gets kind of lumped in and called PMS. Um, however, what PMS really is, or these symptoms, is just a hormonal dysregulation um, and kind of bypassing these physiological benefits and not understanding these physiological shifts that happen and aligning our lives properly with it. So this last phase, the luteal phase, this is when progesterone becomes the star of the show. So estrogen is kind of coming back down the other side of the slope while progesterone is rising to a peak in this phase. And with progesterone rising to a peak, some really interesting and amazing things happen to the female brain significantly. So yes, our energy levels are starting to kind of decline as we have that decrease in estrogen. But when we look at what's going on with us neurologically, we see some really cool things. So one is that we get a nice rise to a peak in something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Now, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF, is a neurochemical that increases our neuroplasticity and our neurogenesis. So during this phase, not only is our brain more moldable, meaning that we have a heightened ability to learn, to adapt, to grow, to change our behaviors, to um, you know, set in new behaviors if we're trying to you know, quit smoking or change our diet or things like that. This is a really powerful time to leverage to be able to do those kinds of things. We also get this nice boost in neurogenesis, which means that our brain is literally growing new neurons at a higher rate during this phase. Now, there is one caveat to that, and this is a pretty big one that most women are, um, are not realizing and kind of bypass these benefits, is that we have to get quality sleep during this phase. And our sleep requirements actually increase during this phase specifically because of what's going on neurologically. Now, the cool part is how beautiful and brilliant the female biology is, is that progesterone is saying, hey, no worries, I got you. And it's giving us a little boost in the GABA neurotransmitter during this phase so that we can get better, more restful sleep and benefit from these neurological shifts that happen. And so GABA neurotransmitter is our kind of down regulatory neurotransmitter, whereas the other ones that we talked about are up regulatory in terms of excitatory and mood boosting. GABA is all about relaxation. It helps us to um, slow down and prepare for sleep. And it also helps us to remain asleep, get restful sleep, and it enhances our memory consolidation. So if you think about how cool this is, our body is saying, all right, I'm gonna give you all of these neurological benefits and I'm also gonna help you to sleep better during this phase so that you can actually tap into those benefits so that you, know, you can learn, grow and adapt at a higher level during this phase. Now, if you think about that in our application in our lives, how cool is that? We have this phase where we can literally leverage this uh, brain boosting ability that we have to get things done, to learn new things, to change our behaviors, to adapt, to rest, to recover. Um, but we have to be aware of how these things shift. Now, another thing to be aware of in this phase that is typically the culprit for the dreaded PMS uh, symptoms, and that is that during this phase specifically, our nervous system shifts in from more of a um, parasympathetic 
dominance into a sympathetic dominance. So our stress capacity is lowering during this phase. So what that means is our nervous system is a little more sensitive during this phase. So all of the things in our lives that you know contribute to our stress levels, whether it be mental, physical, emotional, um, things in the environment, whatever it is, they will have a more significant impact on us during this phase. So what does that mean? That means if we are not aware of that and we don't shift our lifestyles and shift our exposure to um, different stressors or work to increase our stress capacity during this phase, we're more sensitive and we have a higher risk of this adrenal burnout, right? And that is also going to impair our ability to sleep. So that's usually what's happening is we're unaware of this nervous system shift. We're not um, shifting our lifestyles to accommodate this, this more sensitive part of our nervous system um, that happens every month. And as a result, the stress bucket or stress capacity is being filled to overflowing. And then we're seeing symptoms which are being called PMS. Wow. That is so good. I took notes. I wrote everything you said down. <laughs> this is like a masterclass for me. So I love it. Um, it's really helpful. And I'm just trying to think about how I may show up, like if I can remember different times, because sometimes, and I know, I feel like a lot of women also might relate to this where sometimes in that luteal phase, it's like, oh, I just want to get my period already so I can feel better because, you know, that's where some of that like dysphoria and, and different mood issues really come in kind of heavy for some people with the, these dysregulations that used to be me. I used to always break up with whoever I was dating right before my period started. And then my period would begin. I'm like, Oh, I'm like, Oh, I'm I, like, it was like, I had to shake off that fog of, of this person that I became. So my hormones were very dysregulated. I had really bad PMS and when I fixed my blood sugar, all that went away. And I didn't know that was possible. I didn't know it was possible to feel normal during the luteal phase. And like you do say that <laughs> it does get a bad rap because that's where the problems really show up. So I know a lot of people just, it's like, I just want to bleed already. And they just want to get their period so they could feel normal. And I'm thinking, I always feel maybe this like burst of energy because I got my period, but you were saying that it's a little bit more low energy, but I think on day one and two, it is a little bit lower energy, but yeah. it's a dip, it is a shift from yes. the luteal phase. So there's a difference in feeling, and I don't know, maybe it's the, the neurochemicals that are changing because it's hard to describe with just, you know, basic words of like, oh, I feel different. <laughs> you know, it's hard to put your finger yeah. on it. Yeah, and you know, that's what I find is um, when I'm able to connect with women and teach them about their four phases, almost every single one of them say, oh, I knew that about me. I knew I was different, but I just didn't understand why. And oftentimes we're told, you know, to ignore that and that that's not true or that that is um, a sign of dysfunction or illness, right? but it's actually perfectly natural and normal. And when we can understand these different four phases of us, we can navigate with them and we can allow ourselves to get what we need in each phase. And we can allow ourselves to tap into those cognitive superpowers that we have each version of us. And we're able to get more done in less time, be more effective, feel more fulfilled, have steady energy, have enough focus to get what we need done. It's really, you know, about understanding these resources and where to put them, how to use them, because they do change for us, unlike our male counterparts who are the same every day. And so they can get away with, like you said, fasting every day. They can get away with keto diet every day. They can get away with exercising heavily every day. They can get away with doing the same things and being consistent. For women, consistency is not the key to success. It is the killer of success for us because our biology is not consistent. Our biology is anything but consistent. So we have to be able to learn how to navigate, you know, with those changes that occur. I, I need to write this down. This is so good. 
<laughs> it's it's <laughs> such an interesting concept because I feel like I've been starting to talk about this more, but I love what you said. So I feel like one of the things that I teach in my blood sugar mastery program is I talk about how and when to bring carbohydrates back in. We talk about the cyclical approach. Um, Dr. Mindy Pels has a new book out um, coming out about fasting fast like a girl. So it's talking about yeah. what you should do. And I saw our keto con talk about like all the different ways that you should fast and shouldn't fast at different times in the cycle. So I'm really excited about that information coming out. But I talk about this, how we live in a cyclical planet that changes seasons and yeah. we have a cycle every 28 to 30, whatever days that we, that the consistency is that that killer because what will help us one day is not helping us the next. And so I think so many people are so focused on, I need the one supplement that's going to help. I need the one diet that's going to cure this. I need the one exercise routine. Like it's like, no, it's Peloton. No, it's yoga. No, it's this. It's never one. It's never one. And it makes it more complicated. So sorry, but we're here to help. <laughs> um, yeah. But I think that knowing this information, just knowledge is power. And it really just will help people to be like, oh, it's okay that I don't feel like busting out a hit workout today. It's three days yeah. before my period. Let's go to yoga instead. That's more biologically appropriate. And it's going to do better things for your hormones and your neurology and, and maybe just your self-talk. <laughs> over yeah. time. So what are some, like some quick tips? I mean, I think that we can start to put together that we should be doing our, you know, power lifting and things in that second follicular phase. Um, we yeah. should be doing more restorative things maybe during the menstrual cycle and the luteal phase. Um, is there anything else sort of diet lifestyle, blood sugar stuff that might show up in these different phases that you wanted to highlight? Oh, absolutely. Um, and one thing that, you know, we have to address first, which is something that we were talking about with the PMS and with women, maybe not necessarily feeling like, like, oh, that that's not how I feel during that phase. Um, a lot of this, the issues that we deal with as women, when it comes to burnout, when it comes to autoimmune dysfunction, when it comes to hormonal dysfunction, um, when it comes to menstrual cycle issues like painful periods, PMS, PCOS, all of these things stem from a lack of understanding how to properly care for our bodies and how to properly navigate with the shifts that occur over the course of a month and trying to fit our square peg in a circle hole when the square peg is only a square peg one week out of the month and then it's a circle and then it's a triangle and then it's an octagon right so we have to learn how to be able to shift we are chameleons that's our natural way and that's that's the feminine right it's it's a little chaotic um it doesn't fit into a perfect definition or category and it's our superpower so when we're not in alignment that's when these hormonal dysregulations happen and blood sugar is a huge huge piece of our hormonal related health so right because our sex hormones these ovarian hormones estrogen and progesterone are the centerpiece they are the the pace maker of our global biology and our physiology they're important to care for in order to have a healthy biological rhythm and be able to navigate through these phases. So a lot of us are dealing with some level of hormonal dysfunction because we have not cared for our hormones the way that they need to be cared for. And there are two other hormonal keys that impact the health of these sex hormones. So if you picture, you know, female related hormone health, um, as a stool and it's got three legs. If you knock any one of the legs out, you're going to knock the whole entire stool down, which is burnout, which eventually leads to hormonal burnout, which eventually leads to autoimmune dysfunction and PCOS and PMS and pain and all these things that get kind of lumped in under these categories. 
And those three legs of the stool are sugar, sex, and stress, right? The three S's. These are the big important hormonal related pillars um, for women's health. So sex, we already know that's estrogen and progesterone. Those are our sex hormones. And in order to have healthy sex hormones, we have to be able to regulate our blood sugar. So sugar is the other one. I'm talking about blood sugar. And what I'm really talking about is insulin. We have to have insulin sensitivity in order to keep our female hormones in check. And in order to keep our, our uh, sugar in check, our blood sugar, our insulin sensitive, we have to get our stress in check. And when I talk about stress, I'm talking about cortisol, right? When cortisol is dysregulated, it dysregulates our blood sugar and both cortisol and insulin dysregulation dysregulate our female hormones. That's exactly what happened to me. I had gone so far down adrenal burnout that my female hormones were also burned out. And this is typically the case with women, depending on where they are in that hormone uh, or in that burnout cycle, right? So be, to be able to manage your um, sex hormones, it's a lot more than that. It's deeper than that. It's not just about those hormones. It's about our lifestyle. And the way that we navigate through our lifestyle has to align with these physiological shifts. So we're adding another layer of complexity, right? So we have to take care of these three pillars but we also have to understand that these three pillars, all three of them change through the four phases of our cycle. So the way in which we care for these three hormonal um, pillars is different in each phase. So I'll just talk about a couple of things that we can do in each phase. And by the way, each phase is a lot more complex than, than what we've talked about. We've given, you know, a little overview, a little taste, but what happens in each phase is so amazing. And yes, very complex, but there's so much to be gained in each phase. And as women learn this, they will love every single phase. They'll love their period. They'll love the luteal phase. They won't have to deal with PMS anymore. And they'll love every part, not just the follicular phase, which is typically when we all are like, oh, okay, I feel great. I feel on fire. I'm ready. Um, and then the rest of the time we're like, oh, right. But you can love every single phase when you understand what your body needs. And then you're able to give your body what it needs in each phase. So again, phase one, this is a menstrual phase. The body is kind of like downshifting during this phase. So the key is to be able to take those resources that you have and allocate them appropriately. The other key is to take care of these three pillars. So one, we have to be minding our blood sugar. And in, in order to mind our blood sugar, we have to be minding our stress. Because we have this lower stress tolerance in that phase, right, coming from the luteal phase into the menstrual phase, we still have a very low stress tolerance. So we have to be mindful of our stress management. So ramping up your stress management during that phase, being mindful of how you're using your energy, how you're using your mental capacity and focus doing things that can enhance that like you said meditation mindfulness practice right that can actually um, enhance that cognitive ability of intuition and help you to utilize that superpower in your life and then going from that into phase two um this is, you know, when we have that heightened power, strength, and endurance. So if you want to do those really cardio intense workouts, or you want to do those really heavy lifting workouts, um, this is the time to do those things. And it's not going to burn through your resources because you have more resources to use for these types of activities. Going from that phase into the ovulatory phase, it's very similar, right? So you have this heightened power, strength, and endurance. You have this heightened emotional intelligence. You have 
more resources to burn, right? So you can get away with working longer hours, traveling, um, going to social, late night social events, right? Your body can handle things like that during this phase and not really be negatively impacted because again, you have more resources. And then in the luteal phase, the biggest thing that we have to focus on here is sleep and managing stress because when we're managing stress, of course, that's gonna regulate our blood sugar and that's going to allow us to sleep. It's going to allow us to get better sleep. Um, now, as I mentioned, things are a lot more complex than what we talked about. Even the way that we um, metabolize our macros, you know, fats, sugars, and proteins, or fats, carbs, and proteins, is different in each hormonal phase because estrogen and progesterone impact the way that we convert our food. So there are different types of foods that we need to be fueling our hormones with, and there are different uh, types of foods to fuel our bodies with because of those metabolic mechanisms and how they shift through the hormonal phases. So there's a lot of things that we can do, and there's a lot of ways that we can align our lifestyles with you know these different these different pegs the square the circle the octagon whatever it is um but there are different ways that we can navigate through our lives and starting with low-hanging fruits like shifting around little things with our schedule getting better sleep minding our stress right and then going up to the bigger things like when is it appropriate to fast right this is a huge topic, especially in the field of biohacking. And really, and you know, Mindy um, will back this up, the only real safe and appropriate time to fast for women is during phase one, the menstrual phase. But the problem is a lot of us are dealing with some kind of hormonal dysregulation, especially during that phase, right? Because we have less resources. So we're kind of burning through them. We're going into that burnout cycle. Um, and because of that, we'll experience things like cravings for sugars and carbs um, because our body is, is not being supported with those three pillars that we need. But because of how the metabolism downshifts, our metabolic requirement is less. And so we literally need less um, calories during this phase, but also our hormones are not in production during that phase, right? We're at this low hormonal phase. So we don't have to be as mindful as giving our hormones the right fuel in order to be productive. That makes so, so much sense. So yeah, so there's there's a lot that goes into it. I know this is like a fire hose of information, but just tuning into your body and realizing that you are absolutely right when you feel like this worked for me yesterday, but it doesn't work for me today. Yes, that's true. So give yourself the grace, give yourself the permission to do things differently because you are different. I love that. That is, I think, that we need that invitation. So many women were, you know, people pleasers. We're trying to get things right. We're, we tend towards perfectionism and we're trying to get it right. And sometimes what is actually right, what you are telling us is that we can take a day off, that we can say no to, you know, a social event, a hard work, working overtime, like these are the things that like, please give yourself this permission to do this because this is going to really, really help your hormones and everything that comes with it and your brain and how you feel. So I think it's so interesting that pillar. I love those types of analogies. I'm a very visual person. So I like thinking about all three and how the, the stress component is really heavily impacting the sugar component, of course, and the hormones. So um, it's like these three, they really are so intrinsically linked. And we often just want to forget about that stress piece. And when I say we, I'm specifically talking about myself <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah, because it's like, I don't have time for this. 
I do. I'm not making time for it. And, you know, we're stuck in this sympathetic overdrive today. I just released a podcast episode talking all about the vagus nerve. And so it's, it's like, there's so many signs to me, like, Hey, you probably need to slow down (laughs) because it's starting to get to a point where my insulin isn't where I want it to be. And I'm eating well, I'm doing all the things I'm like, Oh man, it's stress. This is what I tell people day in and day out. Like I'm talking about it, but this is where it's really hard to do those lifestyle changes. But I hope that knowing, I mean, even just for me, knowing when to schedule those things, when I can, you know, get the other stuff out of my system, when I, it's like, cool, green light, do the workouts, you know, fast a little bit more, do keto. And then it's like, when it's okay not to like, wow, that actually feels really good. And when you know that our biology is set up for these things. So we get to have the benefits when we know when to put these things in. It's not like, Hey, you can never fast do it at the time that works for your body. It's like, Oh, I can have some carbs, you know, some people and do it at the right time when your body is going to really benefit from it. So this has been so incredibly helpful. Um, Do you have one more second to just talk a little bit about biohacking for women and how it might be a little bit different for us? Like any sort of things, because I know you're biocurious Kayla, and I know you're into, I like the biocurious more than the biohacking because it feels, hacking feels like I need to make changes all the time. It's a very masculine word. You know, I think Dave Asprey coined it, but like biocurious I love that because I was just talking with our uh, um, friend, Kristen Weitzel, and she was saying that she had this really big blood sugar spike out of nowhere at night, no, like no apparent reason for it. And she was just saying that, you know, a lot of people can get really nitpicky, like, oh my God, this is happening. I need to do this, this, this. It's like, or we can look at it and not freak out and just get curious. We can be like, huh wonder why that happened. I wonder if there's a pattern here. I'm just going to pin that in my mind and like maybe jot some information down, see if it happens again. I'll come back to it, see if it's part of a bigger pattern. So this idea of being bio-curious is I feel like we're zooming out and we're just getting like, oh, what can help me feel better instead of that mindset of like, oh my gosh, my aura ring score is not good. My HRV went down. I need to do something about it. Like that is so stressful. That mindset is so stressful. And I know it, it takes more than like just hearing about it to sort of change your mindset, but sometimes hearing about it can give you an alternative way to think about something. So I hope that's helpful for someone, but I love this curiosity and I love that you, you know, phrase it like that. So anything that you wanted to say about bio hacking for women? Absolutely. And you really hit the nail on the head with the curiosity piece. Um, So what I always say is biohacking is not only different for women than it is for men, for the obvious reasons that we just discussed, but biohacking is actually more important for women than it is for men. Why? Because we have the data on men. And we have really good data um, in terms of, you know, fasting works really well to increase metabolic flexibility. Yes, those studies show that. And yes, those studies were done on male bodies. Um, If a woman had been doing the same studies or a cohort of women had been doing the same studies, you would find out that a fasting routine really only works well during one of the phases and the other phases it actually dysregulates our hormone health. Um, So for women, an N equals one approach to our health is more important because we don't have the data. We can't rely on the blanket recommendations that are out there from our favorite biohackers and our favorite influencers. Just know that, yeah, that's, that is probably really good information for you at a certain time in your cycle, but not always. So that's why biohacking is more important. We have to take an N equals one approach to our health. We can't necessarily rely on the protocols that are even out there in medicine. Um, Because again, what is fueling those protocols is the data that is coming from research that is done primarily or exclusively 
on men. So we have to just be aware of this. And with that comes power, right? That's knowledge comes power. And then we can take ownership of our health and we can actually do our self-experimentation, which is what biohacking is all about. It's about self-experimentation. It's saying, I'm going to try this. I'm going to track the results and I'm going to see if it works for me. Now take that and apply it to the four phases of your cycle. And now you've really got something. Now you have the ultimate biohack, right? And now you know how to map your biohacking efforts in alignment with your body. So that would be my big suggestion to the women who are listening is when you feel like, um, you know, this doing cold exposure every day, for instance, it sometimes feels great. And then sometimes it doesn't listen to that voice that is accurate. Something like that is not always going to be beneficial for you because of how the nervous system modulates, right? If your nervous system is more sensitive, like during the luteal phase, your stress capacity is lower. Even cold exposure, while it is a form of positive stress, you stress, right? It is still stress and it still goes into the same stress bucket where all the other stress goes in. So if that bucket's already overflowing and then you add this extra piece in that normally you can handle well, well now all of a sudden you can't handle it well and you're wondering why you can't sleep and you're wondering why you're gaining weight and you're wondering why you're having mood swings. Well, you know, maybe it has to do with those, those choices. So that's what I would say for women is, um, you know, zoom out, be curious about your biology and look at the four phases and align your biohacking efforts with the four different versions of you and with what is required from your body in each of the four phases. And if you can do that, um, you will have a lot more success with your biohacking efforts. I love that. I think it's so important and it's just an essential piece for women. And I love that you sort of described biohacking as experimenting because that's sort of the terminology that I've always used. I'm like, oh, I just like to experiment on myself and, you know, what's going to happen, you know, if I eat this ice cream, is it going to, you know, feel good, feel bad, give me pimples, like what's going to happen? And do I want it? Then you can choose, like, do I want that result next time? And so it gives you so much power. And it's not just with like food sensitivities, but also it's like, what happens if I commit to going to yoga three times a week for the second phase of my cycle or like the, um, I'm sorry, the, um, the last two weeks of my cycle in the luteal phase. And, you know, what will happen if I try a fast the first, you know, week of my menstrual cycle? i I think that it's so good to ask these questions and it just so much information. That's so helpful. I'm so excited. <laughs> so glad we had this conversation. So where, yeah, where can people find you if they want to learn more? Yeah, if you're interested to learn more about, you know, the female neuropsychophysiology and you want to learn more about these four different phases and versions of you, um, you can pop over to herbiorhythm.com. Um, and then I also share a ton of free information on my social media. Um, so my handle on socials is at biocurious underscore Kayla. Those are the two best places to find me um, and reach out and find more information. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kayla. It was a pleasure chatting with you. I can't even tell you the amount of notes that I just took. I appreciate you giving us all this really, really helpful information that all women will benefit from cycling women, I guess we should say. Um, I'm sure there's much more we can talk about. I think that women who um, after menopause, they get a lot more flexibility. Would you say that? Because I, I didn't ask you about that. Would they get more flexibility? Well, let's just talk about this for just a second. Sure, sure. Okay. We can't ignore our postmenopausal ladies, right? Right. Um, so the good news is that our biological rhythm, these four different phases, physiologically, neurologically, biochemically speaking, still remain intact even postmenopausally. 
No way. Now, this is what we know through anecdotal evidence. And if you're a postmenopausal woman thinking about this right now, kind of just tune in and you'll you'll um, be able to reflect that, yeah, I still have these ebbs and flows of energy and of focus and of different um, cravings or different things my body needs throughout the month. Well, because we only have anecdotal evidence, right, because of this research gap and our postmenopausal ladies are even more excluded in a lot of ways, um, we are not asking these questions in our traditional science, but through surveys and anecdotal evidence of accounts of women, we know that they still experience this. So my theory um, that eventually I will be able to conduct research to figure out exactly the mechanisms, why is this the case? But my theory is that before menopause, this is the vast majority of our lives as women. It's the big chunk right in the middle, right? And during this time, our physiology is groomed to operate in this month long cyclic fashion. When we go through menopause, what happens is that the ovarian hormones are passing on the baton to the adrenals. When that occurs, women do not just then become men, right? First of all, we still have way higher levels of our female ovarian hormones um, than our male counterparts, estrogen and progesterone. And secondly, because our bodies have operated in this month long way for so long, for the vast majority of our lives, it remembers and it continues on in that way. Um, now, of course, you're not having the hormonal shifts, you're not having the peak and um, fall of estrogen and then peak of progesterone, but your physiology in terms of your metabolic function, your cardiovascular function, your brain function, all of those things that we talked about, those still work in this cyclic fashion. So it's quite fascinating. And it's an area um, of research that we need so much more data on in order to really understand the mechanism scientifically. But, um, you know, it is, uh, I think, comforting to a lot of women who are postmenopausal that come up to me and tell me, I still experience all those phases. And I'm like, yes, you do. Oh, you know, so you're cool. not, you're not crazy. You absolutely do. That's how your body works because you're a woman and that's how it knows how to work. So, um, so I just want to leave that little tidbit yes. for our postmenopausal ladies. You are not left out in this. This still all applies to you, though the mechanisms of action are likely different. We just don't know exactly what those are. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I really look forward to all the research. <laughs> it's going to be yeah. great. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Kayla. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. I okay. appreciate it. Bye-bye.